Hello, everybody. This is Dave Gray. Uh, as some of you know, I'm working on a book called Agile Design Principles, which was earlier called Agile. No, it's oh, no. It's now called Principles of Agility. It was called Agile Design Principles. Sorry, we just changed the title. Um, and I'm here talking today with uh, Madeline Gannon. I'm, Madeline is a designer and a researcher in computational design, and I'm sure we'll get into exploring what that means. Um, she has a research lab and a company called Mad Lab. It's uh, madlab.cc, and you can find Madeline on Twitter at, at Madeline, M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E, G-A-N-N-O-N -N -N on Twitter. Welcome, Madeline. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you, too. So, um, maybe let's just start by uh, talking a little bit about what you do. Can you explain computational design and, and the kinds of things that you're working on? Yeah, computational design is um, basically anything that has to do with the computer and anything that has to do with design. Um, so the way that I begin to explore it is, is thinking about uh, the intersection of computer science, robotics, and architecture, and the sort of play space uh, where those three avenues meet. So uh, my work is primarily um, bouncing back and forth between uh, software design and physical output. So I work a lot with uh, 3D printers and CNC routers and um, industrial robots, and I create applications that connect designers to those output machines. Okay, so you're working in you're working on things that are pretty new. Um, they're going to be operating in environments that are where you have a lot of unknowns. Uh, is that a fair assumption? It's very fair. <laughs> Okay, so you're, you're, you're sort of designing things that, you know, haven't really been thought of. Uh, and, you know, you sort of, it makes me think of Leonardo da Vinci, you know, where you're, you're prototyping and modeling things that, um, that don't exist yet, and you're having to figure out how, the, how is this going to change the world, or how, how, are this, how are people's paradigms and worlds going to have to change in order for these things to work? Is that a, that, I mean... That's a, that's a very generous comparison, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, so um, so t talk. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of environments um, that you are that you're that you're working in. I mean, you said industrial robots. You said um, 3D printers. Um, you you're you're just you're you're creating things. And um, how do these things come into the world? Um, um, well, they're, it's interesting because they they currently exist and they exist in, in many different domains. And 3D printers have been um, in the news a lot lately because they're becoming more accessible. And they're, they're are, they went from sort of uh, industrial commercial versions to domestic um, versions of 3D printing. Um, so what I do, especially when I begin to develop a research question around um, a technology, is I just begin to explore what that may look like in the future, um, in all its sort of different branches and, and tangents that it may go in. Um, so what's an example of a research question? Can you give us a good an example of one that? So I'm 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 working right now. I'm thinking about um, uh, what basically it's posing a what if. What if uh, industrial robots leave the factory and go onto a construction site? Um, uh, what are the certain uh, things that we need to have, which has to do with um, safety, but also communication? Um, so the, a, a big domain that I, I like to work in is um, programming without a computer. So building software interfaces that lets you communicate with these machines without having to sit at a, a computer screen. Um, which OK, so let's talk about that. That sounds fascinating. How do you? I can, I, I'm having trouble even imagining programming without a computer. If I talk, do you talk to the to the robot? Do you? There's a there's a lot of things. So I'm working now um, with being able to uh, so a, a very specific application. But with industrial robots, you you usually program in the computer paths for them to move in space. So they'll take a line or they'll take a, a motion in space. Um, some of the work that I'm doing now is translating uh, a line drawing that you do on a physical material uh, using a webcam to translate that into what the robot needs. 
So you can be in your environment and, and communicate to the robot just through drawing on a, a, in the physical environment. Well, I can already tell there's a danger I'm going to get completely off track on the Agile principle <laughs> stuff and just kind of want to talk to you about robots. Keep me focused. Keep me focused. <laughs> well, um, so, um, no, I'm saying it's going to be trouble for me to stay focused because it's going to be <laughs> fascinating what you're talking about. Well, let me go, let me, let me drill into the what if because I think that's, to me, that's a really interesting question and it makes me think of science fiction. Um, you know, it's with people. One of the things that people, you know, you know, and I'm a, I like science fiction, so I, there's another tangent we could go off on. <laughs> but the whole idea of asking the question, "What if?" Um, you know, what if uh, the government was able to create drones the size of mosquitoes? You know, and they would, uh, you know, or or an in, or, you know, what? what, what how, how would that affect society? Right? I mean, you, you have. Um, how do you be, how do you start to explore that? Because there are some things that you um, you have to anticipate, but you're also actually building and prototyping things, right? Mm, um, yeah. So let's let's take that research question. What if robots leave the factory to go to a construction site? Um, how do you uh, so, so can you talk a little bit about how you came up with that question in the first place? What, what if you want a, what if you want a robot to help you paint a wall? Pardon. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Robots to help you paint a wall. So you're you're looking at the you're looking at the industrial robots and you're looking at the world and thinking, okay, there there could be other places where, you know, right now robots are tied kind of tied into the factory. What happens mm -hmm. when they? Leave? Okay, so ha what happens after you after you define that after you come up with that question? Uh, I look for examples where that may already exist. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, or in some way or form may already exist. So mm -hmm. one one space that robots are in domestic settings is with um, uh, a assistive mechatronics. So wheelchairs that have mechanical arms, um, for example. Yep. Um, and there there are certain um, interaction principles with, with how people use that that I can begin to pull out. So I'm not reinventing the wheel, or I'm not. Um, bucking a, a norm um, that would help me just push my work further faster. Okay, so you look for examples of things. You look for things that are already happening in, in that domain, and you start to. And you said you try. You start to extract principles. Well, that's pretty interesting. How do you extract <laughs> a principle? Uh, uh, you know, I, I've never really thought of it as. Um, I, I just think of it as a sort of design process. I've never actually given a conscious thought for what are the what's the scientific method of pulling out these design principles. Um, yeah, well, maybe just I mean, if you could maybe think about it as a sort of like uh, imagine yourself looking over your own shoulder as you mm -hmm. as you do this and observe your observing your thought process. And uh, I mean, if, if you could, if you don't mind, just doing it out thinking out loud with me. That, okay. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I would look at. Uh, commercial examples, so businesses that are happening, because uh, they tend to be based on research that is at least uh, five to ten years old and embedded and safe. And I would look at research examples from uh, certain conferences and journals that is really uh, about what's coming down the pipeline. Um, for the commercial examples, it's great to see, uh, I like to see how they especially if you're just browsing on websites, how they present themselves and how they present their value to the world and how they differentiate themselves from their competitors. Because that means, especially for a domain that I have no um, uh, prior knowledge in, like assistive mechatronics, mm -hmm. I only learned about it through um, researching or imagining what, what sort of applications industrial robots might have. Um, it helps me extract what they think their value is uh, and what uh, people are, are expecting out of that. Uh, and that sometimes leads to insights as far as communication protocols. Or, uh, so if something is voice activated versus touch activated, um, for example. Um, and then usually from there, I, I do, just, I do a, a, a wide breadth of exploration. And I develop, I try to start developing a, a little tiny prototype that can sort of help me tease out some of the difficulties with applying it um, in my domain space. So let's talk about uh, t little tiny prototype because that 
that does definitely fall into a category of things I've heard people talk about, minimum viable product, uh, minimum possible testable assumption. How do you, what do you t talk about, talk to me about what are the thoughts and ideas and principles that go into designing a little tiny prototype? Well, it's, it's really, it's about outlining uh, your unknowns and starting to pick off which ones might be easiest to test if you can make them knowns. Um, so, for example, um, with, this, with this application for the uh, robots, I had no idea if I could turn a, a, a line um, drawn on the table into a, a digital line. So I just wrote a little program to test that, that would work. That works, then I can move on. If it doesn't work, then maybe I begin to reimagine what that sort of um, interaction is. That's awesome. And so you, do, you, do you map these out somehow? Or do, you have, do, you have a, do you have a list and you prioritize them by how easy they are to test? Or, um, or mood. <laughs> pardon? pardon? Or, or just in my mood. Now. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. that, that one would be fun to test. <laughs> um, uh, yes you, and no. Sounds, uh, sounds <laughs> almost like you have kind of a constellation of, of unknowns and you're looking to kind of triangulate amongst them. Yeah, and that, that also, um, uh, it also begins to inform how the, how the research question develops, because it's not a static thing either, you know, so it's a, it's a heading, um, it gets you the first couple steps, and then the work you do in between begins to tweak where you take your next few steps. Um, so that's the way that, and that's really what um, going from architecture to background in computer science really um, helped me do. In architecture, I would keep my unknowns, my science fiction um, open as long as I could because that's the interesting, fun part. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the discipline um, taught through computer science is to begin to um, have that trajectory, that long trajectory, and begin to break it down to smaller steps to help you get towards it. Yeah, so it sounds like you, you said that the long trajectory is kind of a heading. So it's a direction. But as you learn things, uh, as you build prototypes, and as you make things, and as you learn things, and as you test your assumptions, and your, as more of your unknowns become knowns, that you, you, can, you might be doing course correcting, or you might even change the heading. Oh, yeah, I might stumble across something way more interesting. Okay. I've, I've had that happen. Uh, actually, that's the most delightful when you have this serendipitous discovery of something that you never anticipated when you started. As a, as a designer, that's what I enjoy the most. <laughs> yeah, so how do you, how do you, how do you, um, how, how do you learn to, how do you, how do you keep your uh, mind open to uh, identifying those kinds of um, delightful surprises? Is it? Uh, I think, I think it's, uh, I'm in a scenario where uh, that's encouraged, which is in a, in a research environment. Um, versus in a commercial environment where you have to deliver a product to someone at a certain deadline. I have my own deadlines, but the delivery, the, the deliverable, uh, is uh, not necessarily fixed in time and space. So, uh, so it's just it's just something that you're encouraged to do. And you're so yeah, so you're in a field where you're allowed to drive yourself based on your interests and that's the things that you find that are uh, unique and interesting mm -hmm. in the hopes that they'll be unique and interesting to other people also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, you've got a what if, you've got a research question. You start to uh, look around in the world and see what's already going on. You try and extract some principles for that. And then you start to map out uh, for yourself. You do a broad exploration, uh, map out some unknowns, and start doing little tiny prototypes. Um, can you tell us this, uh, maybe the story of the, your uh, where you are with the um, industrial research and the uh, uh, the robots recognizing lines and so forth? Uh, I have something that's working, but it's not working well. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, I'm also I'm developing something simultaneously that's a little bit tangential, and uh, hoping to merge the two down the line. Um, so rather than getting this sort of perfect thing um, now, I'm going to see what other functionality I can add to it and begin to make the, the perfect thing when there's a more 
diverse, um, more diverse interactions come into play. Okay, so you've, you, you're working on something with uh, whether a robot can recognize a line that you can draw, and um, you've got a little, you've got another thread that's interesting, uh, sort of like a tea kettle that's boiling over in the corner, and you're gonna you're gonna follow that up a little bit. What's mm -hmm. that thread? Is this something you can talk about, or? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has to. It, it's along the same. It's along the same thing. It's it's about being able to um, uh, communicate in the in the physical environment with the robot. So it's a it's a tool that lets you uh, uh, scan a surface. Cool. Uh, so any arbitrary three dimensional surface. I'm, and that's, I'm sorry. That will link up with the the drawing. Uh, right now, the drawing is doable in 2D space on a flat surface, and this will hopefully link up with. Um, okay, so you might be able to do this, like just draw a line in space with your finger, or make a gesture, or or talk to the robot, or something like that. Things like that, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, so you've got. Um, so you, you start with the research question. Um, I, you're you're doing this kind of almost anthropological thing where you look at people who are doing things and selling things and, and think about you talk about look at how they describe the value. Um, I'm imagining that some of those things are where they might be overcoming concerns. So, so that a lot of times when you see the value proposition of a of a new technology, there's a whole story about it. This kind of like frequently asked questions. Um, yeah. you know, what is this? What is it for? Uh, will it hurt my? Will the robot hurt my family? <laughs> uh, sentient, yes. <laughs> right, or whatever, and um, you're ex you're sort of looking at those narratives. It sounds almost like anthropology as well as you know, uh, you're kind of exploring the human aspects of how people understand the thing. Yeah, I never I never really thought of it like that, but um, I guess yes. <laughs> well, there. I mean, if it's a new technology, the people who are uh, selling it are doing some sense making, right? In terms of their marketplace, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where it fits. Um, they have some, uh, probably some, uh, something that is a more or less successful. That they have people buying, they have customers talking about it. Then they start to hear. When you see a customer testimonial, you get an even richer picture. Um, but I think it sounds. I mean, it's it's sort of a, it's a kind of almost like a quick and dirty ethnographic research because you're looking at the the um, the happy story that they're going to tell to their customers, um, which is sort of like they're painting. When someone sells something or markets something, they're painting a, an ideal picture of how that. I think of drug commercials, right? Where people are they're happy. They they have it's a hay fever uh, ad, but they're outside with their dog romping around in the park. Right? <laughs> so there's a kind Apple of side effects are said really quickly at the end. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But there's this. That's that's I think that's one thing, and I and I um, I do that informally as a way of getting a sense of um, uh, the viability of it. But I also I also look uh, what I think is also important is to look at uh, similar companies in the same space and see how, in comparison to each other, how they differentiate my product is better than this product because of. Um, Mine uses touch versus um, a voice command, and I can look. I can I can extract that as okay. Well, maybe there is uh, uh, benefits to this or or um, detractions to that, and it, it helps me just begin to really quickly get a sense of, um, especially when we're talking about interaction, uh, what things are valued in a in a larger community. What 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 aspects the um, product. Is valued in larger community. So you said something that I kind of intrigued me a little while back about architecture, and how in architecture you want to leave your unknowns open as long as possible. There's something in architecture that makes you have. Oh, oh no, no, no! I was a terrible, terrible student because of that. <laughs> usually, and usually in architecture you want to you want to get to a. It's I mean with in school. At least my my view of architecture, um, and one of the reasons why I went into research and not practice, is I believe that um, architecture is is really here to 
build visions of a future of a society, of a culture, um, and not necessarily to build buildings. Um, that that is just my sort of read on it and how I interpret the um, education and skill set and sensibilities that you're taught with architecture. Um, which makes me a bad practitioner, because at the end of the day, you know, you want a building. Um, but I think, I think as far as being able to um, see many years down the road or see a future that doesn't yet exist, but there's signs that it could exist, um, it, it's, it's extremely, extremely helpful uh, training for, for what I'm doing now and research in general. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that because I, I mean I, I'm interested in hearing about what drives you. I think that the internal motivations that drive people is a huge part of how they stay focused in, in um, creating new things or bringing new things into the world, especially when there's a lot of uncertainty around them. You so you have a vision. You have a you have do you have a personal vision for the future of society and culture? Is something that you want to see and want want to bring into reality in the world? I mean, if I were in a if I were in a pageant, I would say like world peace and ending hunger and all that sort of thing. But no, I I mean, it, it, I think it, it's also driven from a, a love of science fiction. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge when using that as an internal motivation is is that your science fiction can become stale. It can become old science fiction, um, uh, which I think is a is a is a huge sort of challenge and motivator for me to read the research papers, to look at what's happening down the road, to fit myself contextually within a historic timeline, to know that I'm working on something that was started 60 years ago or 80 years ago, and it's only progressed this much. How can I get it to the, to the next um, level? What is that next level? Um, so it's this, it's this constant looking backwards and forwards and, and taking snapshots across many different, taking a cross-section of today um, to begin to stitch together what has happened and what may happen. Um, so, do you ever do you take do you do you ever take your proto tiny prototypes out into cultural environments or you know and kind of test them in in uh, the world? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I've had I've had. Some things where some things I've made, you know, I'll just put them on my website for people to download and play with. They have the, the machines for that, and it's it's extremely helpful to get feedback, um, and to to also see what other to see what other people create with it is also very uh, encouraging to do more and share more. Um, lately, I've been working with machines that not enough people have access to. Um, so it, it, it's just not as, as, but that's, but I'm also working on that. <laughs> so, um, so it's difficult to, to share and, and test uh, with a, a wider community, which I, I wish uh, could be engaged with these tools and machines and techniques. Um, what's the role of what's the role of storytelling and narrative in, in your work? I mean, you, you made the comparison to science fiction. I think there. There has to be some kind of story in your mind for you to even start to build, start to build a research question, right? I mean, um, yeah, a lot of what I'm interested in is how to make these CNC fabrication machines accessible to more people. Uh, so uh, narrative happens in many ways. And narrative really happens in documentation as well, mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, it's important to me um, as a designer to have my work um, reach a bunch of different communities. It's important to me as a researcher to have my work be um, vetted by sort of academic uh, circles. So I'm always trying to find that line and, and bounce back and forth between culturally relevant and um, a contribution to an academic discipline. Um, which is uh, still learning how to do that. I, I think that will be a, a career's worth of, of work learning how to do that. But um, but that is uh, sort of uh, a bias that I bring bring in when I begin to approach a, a research problem. 
So you you mentioned um, earlier uh, before we came before we started recording, you mentioned that you have you have a kind of a methodology, but you have it's a, it's adaptable and it's flexible. Um, you have a kind of approach that you take to this work that you do. Is it is that something that you could describe and just kind of a uh, um, sort of a give us an overview of that approach? Uh, I think it adapts to because I because I work in, uh, with such different scenarios, it adapts to whatever I'm doing. So if I'm working primarily in software, uh, it'll it'll be completely different than if I'm working with uh, hardware or with um, uh, fabrication. Um, so uh, I I think I think from what I've I'm trying to think of an overarching methodology. Well, you could just, I mean, you could just describe them in the different contexts. I mean, let's talk about how you do it in software, and then we could talk about how you did it in hardware or something like uh, that. Okay. Um, so in, uh, in software, so one of the things I've done with software is work with 3D printing and 3D scanning, mm -hmm. trying to so it, it begins with sort of a technical inquiry, um, and sometimes they they begin to pile on top of each other. And I think when they do the the work, gets a little more interesting. Um, so the technical questions are things: what is possible, what is not possible, what can be done. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for three D printing, um, one of the things I developed is it began as as wondering um, how do I embed technical knowledge inside a software program so that someone doesn't have to go to school for six years to learn how to make incredible things with this. Um, and that blended with another technical question is, how do I begin to make the connection between digital design and physical fabrication closer? Um, and um, that led to incorporating 3D scanning, um, gestural control so I can move my hands in space to begin to 3D model something and 3D printing and uh, kind of closing that loop. Um, so what what started off as a very technical um, uh, exploration uh, ended up as um, physical artifacts that became of interest to the computational fashion community, which I had, I didn't really Begin thinking of about making um, uh, a fashion piece, but we um, it began to engage the body, and it, I guess just because of my design background, um, it looked aesthetically striking um, and had a sort of editorial feel to it. Um, so th those are the sort of um, interesting permutations of sort of an architectural background and a software background um, mashing up. Against one one another. Yeah, I mean, you you so you, you you have technical questions around what's possible, but it sounds like there is sort of this um, this common theme of that at least sounds like there's a common theme in your work that's about communicating with people, communicating with machines, people communicating with their environment, um, finding ways to communicate that are much more natural than typing into a keyboard. Or that feel more, uh, or that intuitive, or that can be done. So basically, the idea is to, to narrow. It seems like you have a some kind of a vision of narrowing that gap. Yes. Okay, so that's how you approach it with um, uh, software. What about with machines, hardware? Um. So it's again uh, uh, a lot of a lot of things that I work with and with collaborators as well they're far more talented than I am with hardware, is about opening up closed systems. So these, these industrial robots, for example, it's proprietary machines with proprietary software, with proprietary peripherals, and it's all very expensive. Um, because the people who tend to, uh, who are their customers, are large factories like Boeing or Ford or anyone who who's going to buy 40 of them on the production line. Not a uh, research lab is going to get one. Um, so I've been working with um, collaborators to begin to bypass their systems 
and integrate sort of open source hardware and open source software um, uh, as a as a way of um, letting artists and designers and low volume um, uh, industrial robot facilities, um, uh, which could be you know someone who bought a um, obsolete robot after a factory closed down and now they have one in the garage. Um, so that's and that's very nascent. That's at its that's at, that's at its very beginning. Um, but it's a it's another sort of thread of um, bringing digital and physical closer together and making everything a bit more accessible to more people easier. Yeah. So it sounds like you're moving back and forth between asking questions and then uh, creating prototypes or uh, somehow procuring. Um, used machines that you can pull apart and try and figure out how to um, reverse engineer them. At the same time, you're, um, you're looking out in the world for examples of things that are already happening that are along the vector uh, that, you're, that you're interested in. Um, the vector is driven by a personal vision of, that you have um, that may, may be in various uh, ways, hard to articulate, but that you have some kind of personal ownership of. Do you have a, Do you have other uh, fellow researchers that you're working with that you feel people that kind of share your vision? Yeah, is there a Is there a community of people that have this sort of a shared idea? Uh, yeah, um, at, at Carnegie Mellon University, where where I'm at, um, I'm working within the computational design lab. It's uh, code.arc. .cmu.edu, um, and it is a grab bag of misfits from their home discipline that uh, are interested in sort of the anti-disciplinary making and, and doing. So we have people that are architects or physicists, engineers, um, artists. Uh, we have a theologian as well. Um, they're all people who are not quite satisfied with um, the disciplinary bounds from where they came from and want to begin to explore the fuzzy edges of it. Um, and that, that works primarily with something called tangible interaction design, which is a branch of physical computing um, that, again, tries to make uh, the intangible digital world more physical and, and um, malleable. I'm just writing down. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just writing down what you're saying. Explore the fuzzy edges. Tangible interaction design. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, there's also some synonyms. So tangible embedded interaction and tangible interaction design are uh, synonymous with each other. Um, it is, if you're familiar with ubiquitous computing, mm -hmm. uh, it's not really an opposite. But um, for ubiquitous computing, meaning um, computation that happens at the peripheral of our uh, uh, everyday experiences, um, this is about instead of putting it into the ether, putting computation uh, into the cloud, it's about grounding it in something tactile. Um, and uh, a lot of work with modular robotics, as well as uh, instruction kits, as well as um, uh, things that go beep and boop and fabrication happen there. Well, can tell me a little bit about how this uh, you were you were doing some explorations and it became interesting to the fashion industry can, or the wearable uh, what do you call it? Uh, sorry, computational fashion. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about you know how? Can you just tell tell me that story? You know, where were you starting? Um, how did it become? How did the people become aware of it? How did they? How did and where it sort of it morphed to from there? Um, I think I saw some things on your Mad Lab website that sort of felt a like they're in that category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was so that it's um, 3D printed collars, um, but the, the the collars are designed in a software environment that I created. And it lets you, it captures the gestures of your hand movements and um, begins to uh, generate this design based on your 
with your hand and you can 3D scan with your body. So it's that same sort of play with sort of a physical experience and a digital experience trying to move up against each other. But you weren't originally thinking of fashion. Not at all. Okay, so uh, what, were, what was the original vector? I'm trying. To, that's what I'm curious about. How do these things shift? Um, so as want, as right, you, yeah. you're creating, you're you're. you're a lot of shifts. Yeah. They, well, what's happened? What, I mean, I, what I, what's really interesting to me is that you you go along, you have a vector of interest, but as it as it as it's as your ideas start to interact with the world in a tangible way, they give other people ideas and they start to change. I mean, that's the story I'm interested in hearing from you. I, um, how did that sh how did that shift happen? Um, I it I mean for me it was one of those serendipitous discoveries. So I, I started off by and if I'm going into too much detail, please let me know. No, um, just tell the story. Tell tell it like you tell it to a friend. Okay. Who's not very who's not in your research field? <laughs> My mom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started off with a research question: uh, How can I embed? all the knowledge you need to know to 3D print something into a software environment. So I, I, from that, I made an analogy of a squid. So one of the things that, that 3D printing has is you can't have self-intersections. So a, a, a squid, if you think of a squid's legs, it, begins to, it can wrap up a lot of things. Um, it can grab things. A squid, yeah, a squid. A squid like the animal. So you... Like the animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So its, its tentacles can begin to wrap things and grab things, but they never sort of bump into each other. There are, there's always a sort of... Right, so you're saying you can't have like miters joining at a corner or things, something like that. In a right, so two legs won't intersect each other. For right. A, it, has, okay. it has dexterity to begin to wrap around a physical thing. Uh, so I, I created a virtual squid, a, a sort of digital model that had the same sort of properties. It was animated. You could jiggle it around in this physics environment, and its legs would not intersect itself. Its legs would um, begin to waft around um, and um, very playfully, but um, it was 3D printable no matter how much you shook it or um, tried to deform it. Um, so that was my that was my idea of my... that was the a small test to see if my research question could be answered. Um, and the, uh, the research question again was? How do I embed the technical knowledge needed to 3D print into a, into a software environment? So sort of externalizing all the technical that a designer would need um, into a sort of a software framework. So, oh, okay. so, so this is giving me some really great insights into the, the approach that you take, which is what I, okay. I was hoping to get. So what happens is you you're looking at this um, you have a you have a what if question or a, or a, or a how could this work question or how might this go go right and then you say th then you're you're looking into the technology and the constraints of the technology and then you form an analogy which was an actual from the biological world and you're looking at okay um, what does this feel like what do the constraints of this technology feel like right. And then you then you kind of go. It's kind of like a squid. It's got no bones. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's it's in the way that it's uh, you know the the limitations of this particular uh, analogy are kind of like a squid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's in my mind that the leap from technical question to analogy is it's just because I'm weird. Uh, uh, the, the, I think it's linear. Um, well, no, this is, I mean, I think it's fantastic. So you go from technical <laughs> question to analogy. You're thinking about an animal, and this enables you to bring, to to have a, a model, a mental model around which you can bring something tangible. You can create something um, tangible in the world. In this case, it's a 3D model of something that's very squid-like, mm -hmm. right? And, it, and so because you made it very squid-like, anything that anyone could do with it within the, uh, the, the software environment you created would be, 3D printable automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then what happened? What'd you do with this thing that you made? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was just a prototype, and, and while I was doing that, I was creating a creating a mesh um, to 3D print, huh? and forgot to delete. So in, in uh, I forgot to delete something. There was a bug in my code, okay. and what that did is it it um, left a trace of 
every squid over time in my in my software environment. Um, so it was a complete accident. It was considered a bug, um, but it created this beautiful lattice effect um, and this, this structure that no longer looked like a squid. It looked like some sort of ornate, baroque, exoskeleton thing. Mm. Uh, and that was my serendipitous discovery, recognizing that it wasn't a bug. It was actually quite beautiful. I, there's no way I could have thought of it initially. Um, and let me just let me just see what I can do with this, uh, with this technique. Um, because of the algorithms and the things that you created, and actually because of a mistake, you generated something that was more interesting than what you were originally thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's where the that's where the tangent went from this technical question to, huh? That's interesting. Let's see what let's see what this can do. Um, so I, then I brought in. So this thing, even this thing that was created by the bug that was quite beautiful, also had the characteristics of the original constraint that it would be three D printable. Exactly, and it's far more that's complex. <laughs> and that's that's one of the reasons for well, I mean that that example is just um, serendipitous, but also building small chunks of code um, are, is really helpful for building up complexity. It's something that in architecture you usually deal with a lot of complexity and try to narrow it down, and in software you start with something very simple and you layer in complexity. Um. Yeah, so the small chunks of code work perfectly fine by themselves, but as you build them up, that you're creating complexity that you can't necessarily anticipate as the designer of it. Exactly, and you just have to be open and, and also trust that there's going to be something really cool inside of that when you begin to stitch these things together or layer them, layer them together. Okay, um, and so what did you, what you found this kind of, you sort of discovered almost rather than invented this. You, you invented the, uh, the conditions that uh, aro out of something which arose something that you hadn't anticipated that you kind of felt like you discovered it, you know? Yeah. I, more, more like tripping over it than uh -huh. discovering it. More like okay. tripping over it than discovering it. Um, uh, so then I just incorporated, it, it just it formulated an, a, a what if. Um, as far as, now what if what if I could take this and draw it on my body? Um, what if you take this and I'm sorry, what you say? Draw? Uh, draw on my body. Right? Okay. So I have a way of I would have a way of generating something really complex and broke very quickly. Um, what if I could begin to to put it on myself? Because I know I can I can take it out of the um, the digital world into the physical world with 3D printing. What do I want to What do I want to do with it? That led me to incorporate 3D scanning and uh, gestural gestural modeling into into that part. Um, so now you can you can draw something on your body and print it, and it's scaled to yourself. Uh, and there were some technical problems within that sort of chapter um, that had to be sort of worked out. Um, but that's that's the so. And, and what happened with that is it uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why, some more cynical and some more optimistic. Um, Let's get all. So I, I think I think that one of the reasons why this project got picked up is because um, a, a really good friend of mine took beautiful photographs. Um, it really really documented it well. It had sort of two lives going around the blogosphere. One is like the art tech blogs. Um, which they always show, you know, videos of my interface, and then the other life that it's kind of still having now. Um, yeah, the, the half life of internet dumb is quite short, but um, but was they mainly showed my my photographs uh, of the pieces on on models. So it was really interesting to read that the two worlds kind of linked through this similar interest. What they value. One was ar architecture, and the other was fashion. One was sort of like the art tech, and the other one was tech fashion. Okay. Okay, so so there's a little bit about how your ideas were presented and how they were shared, and they were shared in two different domains. Yeah, with with, with not with you know not without its own overlap, but. Um, 
Um, I, I got invited to a 3D printed fashion show um, and calls from uh, pulled calls from some magazines to print work, and um, as well as having this own sort of cycle around the art tech blogs, um, like uh, creative applications and Adafruit and all this really techy geeky stuff, which is where honestly where my initial exploration really began. Um, and it was the, the people I was I, would, I feel I associate myself most with. Um, uh, but it's it is interesting to see, especially when you put something live, and I'm sure you as an author experience this all the time. Um, you put something out there in the world um, that is your sort of you have your own vision of it, and even even in your book, they're your they're your words, but people interpret it. Many, many, many different things. Uh, oh yeah, well that's one of the things that's so interesting. That's why I'm so interested in talking about agility um, principles of agility because I think one of them is a lot has a lot. One of the something about it, there's a lot to do with putting things in the world and the unanticipated effects. And in the in some in some ways, even your software example where you had a bug was an unanticipated effect of putting an idea into the world because you put it into a computer basically. Mm -hmm. And you had an unanticipated effect, and that led to, uh, you know, your what ifs, you know, and your small experiments lead to other what ifs. Mm -hmm. And every time that you take something out of your brain, and you make it tangible in whatever way that you do that, um, it's it starts a cycle that you know that um, can then offer you new possibilities. Even with, with, I mean, for me, I I do. I, I do some writing and some painting too, and it was so, as soon as you put something down with a brush, it, it gives you other thoughts and other ideas, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like you have uh, that tacit feedback from it. Yeah, and what I'm what I'm after is I'm trying to see if we can extract some principles out of this approach, for, especially for people who are trying to get better at it. Uh, uh -huh. It's not, it's a little bit scary to put your thoughts out into the world, isn't it? Your uh. Yes and no. Uh, I think I think there's always the, it does make you vulnerable. It does put you out there. But I think the the sort of feedback that you can get from it uh, far outweighs the it's like it's like um, I think it's the analogy I have is throwing a party and you have that you know that hour before the party where you think everyone's going to show up but you're you're not quite sure and you're just you're just a little nervous and then everyone ends up showing up half an hour late and it's a glorious event and you have such a great time but you have to go through that anxiety right before of, are they aren't they are they aren't they I, I think it's the same thing when you begin to uh, publish your work in, in academic spheres or on blogs like especially I um, Gizmodo uh, is a art tech culture blog mm -hmm. that has notoriously harsh uh, commenters and they happened to pick up uh, my piece, and it was just, it was hilarious and uh, sometimes offensive and heart wrenching and and it was actually a, a dose of reality to read the the comments on it um, because they're they're the commentators were were people outside of my sphere, and for them the work had less value, and it, it's it's good to ground you in realizing that. Your work may not even matter to some people, and that's okay. You just have to find the right people um, that that share your interests and want to help you get better and do better things. Um, I think I think what has been very helpful for me is um, I tend to approach all my work with an ethos of amateurism. Um, if it being all right to not know everything and actually being beneficial to not know the proper Way of doing things, and that's that's a double-edged sword because sometimes you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to do something that is very standard uh, if, when you're working outside of your your discipline. Um, but it also that that's counterbalanced against being able to come up with different ways of doing de doing things that when you're not conditioned by the right way, um, it can begin to help explore. Yeah, that's uh, that that reminds me of a quote. Uh, remember Alan Kay saying one time, you know, who Alan Kay is, yeah, the guy who invented sort of 
perhaps invented the laptop, depending on how you think about it. But he uh, he said, uh, I think it had to do with Smalltalk, which was one of the early object-oriented uh, programming languages, where he's, someone asked him, how could you do this? You kind of invented the graphical user interface. I think I was in the audience of a talk, and someone asked him, you, you kind of invented the graphical user interface, and you invented object-oriented programming at the same time. How did, how did you do that? And he's, he said, I, I, nobody told me it wasn't possible or something along those lines. And he was doing, I think, I have a feeling he was doing something similar to what you're doing, what you were talking about, where when you don't know the right way to do something or you, you're, you, you don't have the benefit of the existing knowledge, you have the opportunity to find really unique kinds of solutions, and that can be a good thing. It can be. <laughs> yeah. So the ethos of amateurism, has it served you well? Uh, so far, yeah. If I, I get to play roboticist. I get to play computer scientist. I get to play architect. Um, and, and then mix them all together in a bowl and uh, figure out basically what that space is. Um, How do you find, do you, do you go out and find mentors and people who can help you figure things out? Or how do you, uh, how do you actually go about approaching something at, with an ethos of amateurism and also getting, figuring out how to make things yeah, happen? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's, again, I think it is really um, being in an academic environment that lends itself to that. Um, it's, it's almost counterintuitive because you ha in a, at a university you have your disciplines and you have your schools. And the School of Art is different than the School of Architecture and the School of Engineering. Um, but I've been able to find sort of safe haven um, uh, with people who are either very much interested in um, blurring those boundaries between what makes an engineer an engineer and a designer a designer, uh, as well as uh, people with, with real depth of knowledge um, in robotics, um, in computer science, um, and the the biosphere of the of the university allows for that. Um, I think I think uh, it's happening more and more in um, what are called maker spaces, which what did you say? Up. It's happening more and more in maker spaces outside of Ma the university. Oh. Mm -hmm. Where you have a bunch of people all coming from their background knowledge, and they're just the thing that puts them together is they just want to make something. And here, everyone has the same sort of sandbox to play in, um, and that sort of that's a sort of healthy amateurism, I think. That you know, you might be sitting next, especially in Pittsburgh, you might be sitting next to uh, a CEO of a, of a large company who's just coming down to tinker. Or you might be sitting next to um, uh, a grandmother wanting to create it for her, knit something on their um, machines for their uh, family. Or you might be sitting next to a world-class roboticist who, you know, or a PhD in physics. All these sort of the weird admixture of, of people in one space, I think, is. Um, Do you have any? I mean, so you spent sounds like you spent you spent some time in maker spaces. Yeah. 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 So what pulls you in? What what gets you excited about a makerspace? What is it that pulls you in? And do you have any theories about why there's a rise of of makerspaces? Why this is happening now? Uh, I think it has to do with with at least for me um, sharing and teaching and the sort of benefit of of um, this, the the sharing culture that happen in makerspaces. The, the the idea that um, I instead of instead of having a because you can have a lot of the same equipment in your garage, in your, in your backyard, mm -hmm. or in a place that has garages. Um, but it, it's different than going into a, a shared space where there's a lot of people working on a lot of different things that, again, it's, I think it's that, that thirst for that uh, serendipitous idea that you just need to be, you need to be in, a, in a charged space with all sorts of different things happening that you can be inspired by uh, or inspire others. Cause, I mean, the best way to learn is to teach, um, and the, the I mean, my my mother says the best way to to um, have friends is to be a friend, and, and the same holds true for for these maker spaces. It's like the more knowledge you share, the more you end up getting back from it. 
um, because it's it's putting your expertise out in the world for people to build on or riff off of or um, ground in reality. Was, was that a long enough ramble? Yeah, no, I, I'm writing it down. I think that's great. The idea, a few things. The, the best, uh, so there's something about the cross pollination of ideas in those shared spaces that's so much better than just looking at a bunch of things in your garage and not really having a lot of, Yeah, being isolated. There's something about the sharing, the, the, the culture of sharing and the best way to learn being teaching. Um, yeah, no, I love it. There's something, I think that. In, in a way, um, uh, I don't, even the even the co-working spaces are probably something similar. Even if they're not making, actually using, um, you know, they may not have robots and and uh, things. But it's skill swapping. Mm -hmm. you know, it's skill swapping as well. Uh, even even if you're in an office environment or design environment, I mean, you 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 share your perspectives of the world. You share your ambitions. You share coffee pots. It's it's all. The, I think the space is, and probably my bias as an architect, um, the the space is undeniably linked to the creativity that happens and the cross pollination. What do you think? That, is there anything in particular about the spaces and the way that they are designed that is makes it easier for those kind of cross pollination to happen? Well, if you look at a lot of them, um, they're they're open. Plans. There's there's not little uh, cubicles with desks that you go to. Uh, there are tables that can be moved. There are uh, communal spaces in strategic locations. Um, what are in strategic locations? Communal spaces. Communal spaces. Uh, yeah. So the water cooler, yep. the coffee pot, the printer, fax machine, the telephone. These sort of things that everyone uses. That's where you have your your by chance interaction with people where you might begin to start a conversation. Not necessarily when you're focused on your work on your workbench or at your desk. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's interesting about this is that a lot of people that I've talked to when they talk when you talk about agile agility or being able to be responsive in, in complex and uncertain environments, it, across disciplinary uh, teams comes up quite often. It's, Having a small team that where you have a good complementary set of skills and enough diversity that people can uh, bounce, get ideas that they wouldn't have, get ideas from the interactions with others that they wouldn't have got on their own. Mm -hmm. And there's something about uh, I've heard people talk about having uh, someone who's an expert who's unwilling to open up their process and sh and share their expertise is not does not often fit well in an agile team. That right. no matter how expert you are. There's a certain culture and understanding of well, we want, we want to learn from each other, and that someone who's a complete amateur might actually be able to have an insight that can help the expert, and to have an openness to hearing that, um, an openness to sharing in order to solicit that, um, mm -hmm. the the ability to have these. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's a. It seems like there is a very strong cultural component to working well as a cross disciplinary. You know. Across disciplinary teams, and it it seems in some ways, you said you you have found it at a university. There are things that there are some things in universities that are probably run counter to that. There are yeah. probably in certain certain silos and schools, and but there are also I think because the people are there in a certain density, and there are so many disciplines in a certain sort of just geographic area right. that uh, you can't help but find those even if it's a small subset of those people um, that you are able to find those people um, and able to connect with them and maybe a maker space is similar. People aren't going to go to a maker space if they're, in order to, to be isolated and not share their expertise, right? Right. Right, so I think it's, I think it's a challenge uh, and I don't know if you've gotten into this um, with the, the research you've been doing but with introverted versus extroverted people. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I'm very much an extrovert, and that helps me sort of. Um, I, I want to seek help from others, um, but I can imagine that um, being an introverted per person can be quite intimidating or um, bad for your creativity or, or productivity to 
being in, being in your maker space, for example, that you might need that isolation to in order to to just for your own process. So I, I don't know if that's something that that you've looked into. Well, it, it did come up in one uh, interview that I had where someone the, the idea that so you have. Uh, for example, you have software developers that are developing a product, and um, they they might be sort of introverted. They don't actually want to go out and sit in a room and watch uh, uh, users use the product. Right. Um, but um, what uh, this particular uh, team did was they created a kind of a buffer zone where they had the the customer using the product, and they had a, like a um, they were filming it, and they had a little kind of movie theater room where the developers could go in and watch without actually having to interact with the customer. <laughs> they could observe and sit in a dark room with popcorn and take notes. And what happened was um, the creation of that sort of liminal buffer space was um, actually really helpful. It was almost like the um, uh, decompression chamber when you're coming up from the deep sea, you know, that, that it was it actually being in that space Actually, they, people were very interested. They were taking a lot of notes, so they, they were getting a lot of good information there. But then there was a subset of those people that were like, oh, wow, I actually want to go in now. Like, now I want to go there and be there. And so it was a, um, it was a, I thought that was an interesting approach to create a sort of a, a borderland, <laughs> you know, <laughs> neutral zone, <Yeah. laughs> where, where introverts could feel, you know, not necessarily raw and exposed uh, but had a sense, had a had an opportunity to kind of get comfortable with the idea, and then some of them opted. You know. I imagine that it empowers it empowers you to do your best work as well. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the certainly the observing of customers in that case uh, led to a lot more personal involvement. I mean, what I have heard from um, other people as well is the more that people can who are building a thing or designing a thing can actually empathize with customers and, and, and feel the things that they feel, um, uh, the, the more motivated they get to, to get excited and excited about the product that they're building. I mean, it's nice to feel that you're making something that other people are using, that they're excited about, even if they're frustrated and having problems. Uh, and if, if, if three people have the same problem or say the same thing, it's kind of hard to argue with it at a, right. at a certain point. <laughs> so, um, well, this has been fun. <laughs> what else? Anything else you think? Uh, you, I mean, I told you a little bit about the book. Do you have any other thoughts that you think might be helpful for people who are, um, you know, trying to get figure out uh, better approaches for exploring un the unknown and uh, working together with others to try and, you know, move into territory that might be unknown or uncomfortable? Yeah, I, I think I think really the the most difficult thing. And I imagine it's also difficult to convince uh, clients is to be comfortable with ambiguity. Um, uh, but I, from a from a personal, as a as a designer, it's taken a, uh, many years for me to be comfortable with ambiguity and be confident in my skill set to know that if I if I start with a heading, that I'll, I'll land eventually. Um, I imagine that's a lot. A lot harder to convince clients to take that journey with you, um, but um, also also people who give out grants. But um, well, so how do you build that confidence? How do you build the confidence in in the skill set? I, th I, th I think it's experience. I think it's I think it's um, I think it's just time in and you know knowing that when you first start, it's going to be rough, be ugly, and in three years' time, you can look back and say, "Look how, look where I, look where I started, and look where I am now." Um, so the advice to someone who's just starting would be, um, you know, to try and find a small experiment that you can put into the world and uh, start to build your confidence that way. Yeah, and but but also to not not tie your self worth to it. You know, mm -hmm. It's it's just a starting point, and the, the more time you put in, the better you'll get. Yeah, so maybe put something out there before you've built a huge emotional attachment to it. Exactly, exactly. I think I think these these little you know that's that's one of the great things in, in the design does really well. Are these these wireframes, these these foam ugly 
inexpensive prototypes to just get something out and, and test. Um, and that it doesn't have to be a, a final product before it gets out in the world. Uh, it shouldn't be, um, because then you put all your love and hope and dreams into it. But, um, but I, I really I dislike, I, I think it's being comfortable with ambiguity and not getting anxiety over not knowing. I, I think that was the hardest thing for me to come to terms with and, and incorporate and embrace as a part of the sort of design process. Yeah, and I think that's nice too. That it doesn't have to be a finished product to put it into the world. That's a really helpful insight because uh, for a lot of people, and I mean, you, you know, even in school, a lot of us are trained. Well, it's it's you know, you don't you you uh, you don't show the thing until you're ready to show the thing. You know, you, right. you and want, it's a reflection of you and and, and your right. your self worth. You know, so it has to be exquisite and perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, Again, my name is Dave Gray, and I've been talking with Madeline Gannon. She's a designer and researcher in computational design at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. She's also got a company called MadLab, which you can find at madlab.cc, and you can find Madeline on Twitter at Madeline Gannon, uh, not dot com, just at sign Madeline Gannon, G A N N O N. Thanks, Madeline. It's been great to have you today. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>